Good morning, everyone. And welcome into this day at Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We welcome all of you to our service, especially those of you who may be seeking a spiritual home. Many of us, too, were also seeking a spiritual home, something larger than ourselves, a place where our hearts could find solace and our minds could explore the mysteries of the universe. Ours is a faith that celebrates diversity, embraces questioning, and honors the worth and dignity of every individual. Here, we don't ask you to check your beliefs at the door. Instead, we invite you to bring your whole selves, the joys, the sorrows, the doubts, and the certainties. We believe that our shared journey is enriched by the unique perspectives each of you brings. In the sacred space, we seek to create a container of compassion and vision, a place where love is the center and foundation of our faith, love that transcends boundaries, love that calls us to action, and love that binds us together as a beloved community. So whether you're a lifelong UU or stepping into our sanctuary for the first time, know you are welcome here. Your story adds to the tapestry of our shared story. I am Larry Morrell. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees here, and I welcome you into this day. As we gather, we acknowledge that this water, land, and shorelines are the traditional territories of the Sklalem and Chimicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our members and neighbors and vow to help restore and maintain these homelands. If you're visiting today, I offer a special welcome and invite you to join us for refreshments and conversation in our fellowship hall out these doors and to your right. We also have a newcomer's table near the patio doors on the way to the fellowship hall where the greeters will be able to answer any questions you might have or to strike up a conversation just because they're there. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, you're all welcome. Our stewardship campaign mascot, unfortunately, Chris, Chris Flutterson, is not able to be here today. I'm going to get it all. Aww. Aww. <laughs> but luckily for us, her cousin, Steve Sorensen, <laughs> flew in to take her place. Steve, are you ready to fly in? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. I told Chris that I'd be happy to inspire you and give you updates if she sent a script. <laughs> I told her I didn't want to wing it. <laughs> Here's some pledge news. The packets were mailed on Monday. Not only do they have a gorgeous brochure, but there's also an elegant save the date card that you can hang on your refrigerator to help you count down the days until the brunch of Palooza on Sunday, April 7th after the service. Everything you need is in the packet. And for the first time, there's a deluxe online pledge packet that's been created with all the information and the online pledge forms. It's on the website's main page. I've got exciting brunch of Palooza news. Weather permitting, we'll have seating outside as well as in the fellowship hall and sanctuary. We'll also have a photo booth and a raffle. We're calling cooks, bakers, fruit salad makers, and volunteers for all sorts of tasks. We have 38 spots to fill. Sign up at the Brunch of Palooza bulletin board by the office or contact Robin Steeman or Peg Hunter. Are you all a fluttering thinking about the Brunch of Palooza? Especially since there will be a celebration of Reverend Linda Hart's 40th year of ministry. <laughs> what a grand achievement. When Chris told me about a group of generous donors that have volunteered to match all pledge increases, I couldn't believe it. It's exciting to think about stretching your pledge like that. A big goal is to have all the pledge forms in by Sunday, April 7th. That deadline is critical. The Finance Committee needs that information to create a budget in a timely fashion. It's a big job. 
Please help them. Please plan to come feast, have fun, and turn in your pledge form if you haven't already. Chris predicts that we will have a successful pledge campaign this year. She told me that with all the heart at QUUF, the pledge increase and the match challenge, the sky is the limit. Say it with me. The sky is the limit. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now let us settle our minds and calm our hearts. Good morning. Good morning. Am I on? There I am. You never know how long it's going to take to get sound going. Our opening words this morning are by Wayne Arneson. We come together this morning seeking a reality beyond our narrow selves, which binds us in compassion, love, and understanding to other human beings and to the interdependent web of all living things. May our hearts and minds be opened this hour to the power and insight which weaves together the scattered threads of our experience and helps us remember the wholeness of which we are a part. Please join me in our chalice lighting words for this morning. We light our chalice knowing that our hope and our passion are needed to change the world. We bring different gifts to the work, but we come together in one faith that what we do makes a difference, both to our world and to ourselves. Let's join together in singing our opening song. Uh, it's uh, The Fire of Commitment. If you want to look in a book, it's the Teal Book, number 1028. Our hunger and our pain. 
compassion be to call us on our way when we live with deep assurance of the flame that burns within then our promise finds fulfillment and our future can begin. The stories of a living brings a song both brave and free, calling pilgrims still to witness to the life of liberty. When the It's our time for all ages, and we have a story today. I can see that we have at least one person who is young in body. If she's willing to come up, and those of you who are uh, young of body, mind, or spirit are welcome to come up as well. Good morning. Oh, I'm so grateful you're here. I mean, I would have read it to y'all, but I'm really happy to have some someone for whom this is really directed to. This is called Everything is Connected, and since you are part of everything, you are connected to everything. Did you all know that? Yeah, good, good. All right, you want me to, here, you and I can look at it together. This is awesome. You are connected to a human body, to hands and eyeballs, teeth and toes, elbows, a butt, and even a nose, to a heart and some lungs, and a strange-looking stomach, and a brain that's so smart, there's no peak it can't summit. Some clever rhymes here. You're not just a body, you're bigger than that. You're connected to everybody, to moms and to dads, to sisters and brothers, and uncles and cousins, grandfathers, grandmothers. You're connected to friends and to teachers at school and even to people who don't think, um, even to people you don't think are cool. You're connected to people in Denver and Maine, in Paris and Baghdad, to strangers in Spain. You're connected to every human on earth. Wow! And they are connected to you. You are also connected to hedgehogs and cats and dogs and squirrels and birds and rabbits and cows and deers by the herd, to monkeys, tarantulas, dolphins and snakes. Ooh. And friend, you're connected to every 
big, small, hairy, slimy, snuggly, scaly, floppy, flappy, bristly, buzzy, beautiful creature on earth. Even blobfish. <laughs> Even blobfish. Blobfish, you say? Surely not that. They don't look like me, talk like me, or act like me. And they probably stink. But you see, we're connected. We all play a part. In life, we're the same. We're all blobfish at heart. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> there you go. Now, this is the part. Though bonkers is true, I'm afraid you're connecting to, connected to everything humans have made, to toys and to playgrounds, books and to chairs, to gardens and medicine, language and prayers, buildings and bicycles, buses, balloons, hammers and paintbrushes, tractors and spoons. But also to chicken pox, bullies and lies, to greed and pollution and trash piled high. You're not just to connected to things that you like, things that are comfortable, easy or nice. As a human, you're part of the everythingness and sometimes it's scary and a big ugly mess. But the good news, my dear, is that you are quite powerful, a force that's in everything, timeless and wowerful. Wowerful. Do you have a new word? Do you have a new word? Wowerful. That's a good word. You're even connected to things you can't see, the invisible world, at least uh, for at least you and me to cells, DNA, diseases and death, amoebas and gravity, atoms and breath, to hydrogen, nitrogen, nanobots too. You're connected to them and they're connected to you. You're connected to happy, connected to sad, to the past and the future, to thoughts you have had, to pharaohs, Ben Franklin, T-Rex, ancient Greece, to love and to poverty, hunger and peace to Jesus uh, and Buddha, Muhammad and Moses, to spaceships and aliens with noses like hoses. You're connected to all that will be or has been. You're this very moment where all things begin. You are the sun and the moon and the stars, Venus, Jupiter, Nep Neptune and Mars, comets and galaxies, voids and black holes. You are the universe, perfect and whole. And that's our story for today, helping us remember how we're connected to everything. And we're connected to each other, with our, especially with our hands across the aisle. So if those on the aisle could rise and make an arch, we'll sing out the door. Go now in peace, go in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you That's really lovely. I'd like to interject something, if I may, may. In the Friday update, you had a chance to see all the beautiful people who are running for election for the board and the uh, nominating committee and the endowments committee. And if it was up to me, I'd vote for every one of them. What a beautiful, beautiful bunch of people who are wanting to be our leaders for this next year. So I hope you take your time to check the Friday update and check on these people. You'll find them just lovely 
and I'm so pleased. There's a testimonial by Shirley Brandel, is she here? She's not, okay. We pause for a time of generosity and to receive an offering which today goes to the Production Alliance. I invite Danny Milholland to tell us a bit about them. Danny? All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm here with dear friends and members of the Production Alliance. Um, Julia and Dan have helped to create the Production Alliance over the years, and our core team members. So I'm very happy and proud to be with these two fine <laughs> Unitarians. And um, I have a few words to share about the Production Alliance. And then if either of you want to share a brief statement, you can. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Danny Milholland. Grew up here in Port Townsend, grew up attending the Unitarian Fellowship um, in part, and was one of these youth, beautiful kids that went now in peace, and here I am. <laughs> My family, uh, the Millhollands, are, are an activist family. I grew up in a family of uh, community organizers. My parents were founding members of the Port Townsend Peace Movement the Sister City Project with Jalapa, Nicaragua, mm -hmm. the Rosewind co-housing development. I grew up watching meetings happen all the time, <laughs> going to boring meetings. That was my childhood. And I've chosen that path for myself. And um, <clears throat> had the opportunity, I won't share the whole history of the Production Alliance, but it is a fun story that got us to this point. And this year, we are presenting the most events we've ever produced. We produce community celebrations. We put on events like the Cake Picnic, the Port Townsend Chautauqua, the Job and Trades Fair, Field Day, Olympic Pride this year, the All County Picnic, another new one this year, Airport Day, the Farm Tour, uh, Cider Festival, First Night. We bring thousands of people together each year for celebration. All of these events are free or by donation events. We also help other organizations put on events with our equipment, stage, sound, lighting, technical support. And <clears throat> we believe in the power of celebration. Our mission is to build community through celebration. And it's awesome, it's really fun work. And it's made possible in part by community support. We have in the past asked for support to help make specific events happen. This year for the first time as our organization is growing and strengthening, we're asking for support to help our organization build a foundation so that we can continue on for years to come. We, as, as a part of that, we're launching a membership campaign. So for $100 a year or $200 for a family or $30 for a youth, you can become a Production Alliance member and support our events year round. You can also become a member by participating in our events, by volunteering for, for three or more events, or by you know, performing or being a vendor. There's other ways to become a part of the Production Alliance, but this year we're launching the membership campaign to help it sustain. And uh, I think that's the main thing I want to mention. Um, Julia, Dan, do you guys want to add anything? Sure. I'll just say real quick that we have a little set. We're sharing the wel we're sharing the welcoming table this morning. We have a little uh, a sign up sheet and we have a schedule of our events. I'll also say that the Production Alliance is a lot like QUF for me because I'm really shy and I'm really awkward and I have to have some kind of context to get myself out of the house. So it's been invaluable over the years. And I want to say the Production Alliance is my joy. <laughs> Thank you all. Appreciate you. This has been really sweet to be here in this space with you today. Yeah. The ushers will come among you to receive the offering, and additional ways for giving will be. Uh, 
projected on the screen. Please join me in our offering words. This fellowship is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. Call Bill Testament up to give a, a speech about to speak about our stewardship campaign. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to say my name is Bill Testament. My wife Anne is here with me, so I'm speaking today on behalf of both of us, and uh, really proud to just share a little bit about how we feel like fellowship, the stewardship is really an important thing to do. So here's a little bit about our lives and how we came to that notion. So um, by the way, Ann and I are both third generation QUUFers. We came about that a little bit in a reverse chronological order, which I'll explain in just a moment, but uh, it is interesting now that now at least to think about that. So my wife and I have been members of QUF for three years. We moved here from Anacortes, where we had lived for about 35 years. And we had been coming here, though, for the past 20 years because our daughter Shelly, she was here, she was a member of the church, she and her husband, and um, then later on, the grandson. And so we naturally migrated here, and we always said to each other, if we ever move to Port Townsend, we are going to join that church, because we really see that it is the place to be. It fulfills a lot of what we think about, and so that was a thought. Well, we moved here, and we became members. Now, how did we become third generation? Our grandson, Soren, is a member of the youth committee, um, youth uh, service with the owls, which he really loves. 
Uh, Shelly, our daughter, is a religious education teacher for the young kids, and Ann and I have volunteered as greeters and coffee makers so that we can fellowship after the service. So we're involved, and uh, that's what we think we should be as just who we are. Now, let me tell you a little bit about us in particular. Ann and I both were raised in families that believed in giving back to the community. Ann grew up on Vashon Island, and her parents were the sort of the instigators of the first Unitarian Church on Vashon Island. And it still exists to this day. And Ann grew up there as a young person. And my grandfather started the first Baptist church in our little local community in Tennessee. And that church is still ongoing, and it's a church that I grew up in as a young person. So we sort of came from families that were believed that we should be given back to the community. Now, when I was 11 years old, just a toddler, well, a little more than that, a tornado blew through our valley in Tennessee and completely destroyed our house. Uh, we were all in the home at the time. Miraculously, very little happened to us as far as injuries go. But everything was destroyed, everything. In an instant, it was like a fire. You suddenly have a nice home, you have books, you have libraries, you have things that you're, well, you have clothes, you have something, you have dishware, you have this. Everything was gone. The community and the church was just extremely outpouring to us. And they gave us what we needed. In time, it built up again. We got clothes, we got food, we got books. And we even had a place to live until we can get our feet back on the ground and rebuild our home. But this was a great impression to, to me as a kid. But the greatest impression, and I still remember it to this day, my father worked at a printing plant, and there were about 200 employees at that plant. And each person gave a day's wages to our family to help us get back on our feet. And that really imprinted in me, an 11-year-old, just what service is to people and how important it is when you're down and out. But not only when you're down and out, it's just important to be giving back to the community. Both Ann and I were inspired by John F. Kennedy, the founder of the, pre of the Peace Corps, and when he made those famous words of, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That was really embedded in our minds as young people, and we both joined the Peace Corps and went to Peru for two years with that notion in mind of doing things to other people. And uh, we lived in Peru and spent our first two years of marriage in the Peace Corps. And then when we had three daughters, we took them back to Bolivia about eight years later just to show them how important it is to give to other people and to experience another culture. And we went with a Christian humanitarian organization. Uh, and that was a real experience for them, and they still talk about it to this day. Now, about stewardship. A steward, according to Webster's Dictionary, is a person who manages for other people or places. Now, what does stewardship really mean? Well, for one thing, we are coming together as a fellowship here at QUF, and we have come here because we share common ideals and goals, and we want to make the community a better place to live. And that's what this, that's what this fellowship is doing. If we listen to things just like we heard there and every Sunday, I'm always amazed at the influence we have in the community. There are educational programs to help us better understand the world around us. And there's music that we can extremely enjoy. I so much enjoy the music every day, and I know you do too, to sing and be a part of it. I'm so thankful for it. But you know what? It takes money to do all this. It doesn't just grow on a tree. We have to pay the staff. We have to pay the bills, we have to pay our taxes. Financial support is not only important, but it is necessary. So, I want to just ask you to join us 
in becoming a financial steward for QUF and continue to allow it to be a shining beacon in our community. And also just to allow us to come each Sunday and other days too to explore for ourselves the greater meaning of life. That's what I get from a lot of these sermons and the workshops. So, let's do it. We can do it. Read the pamphlets you've got, study them, and make a decision to let's support this wonderful place we're in. And you know what? Future generations will thank us. Thank you. <clears throat> if Chris, uh, Chris, Chris, I can't remember all of her name. If she were here, she'd say, the sky's the limit. Am I right, friends? Can you say it? The sky's the limit. Flutterson, Chris Flutterson, it's here in the script. We set aside time every week to share the joys and sorrows of our community. We recognize that our personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the joys and sorrows of the larger community of life. Oh, there you are. Good. Um, and so we're going to place the first stone today, thinking in particular of no ruse. Did I say that right, Rosanna? No ruse. No ruse. No ruse. Thank you. I'm sorry? Okay, I still can't get it, but no worries. I'll get it after the service. Um, <laughs> it's the uh, Iranian or Persian New Year celebrated by various ethnic groups worldwide. It's a festival based on the Iranian um, solar hijiri calendar. Um, we have UU members and others in our community who recognize this special time of year. I have to say, I was uh, in, at a college in Maine that had a bunch of Iranian <laughs> students, and this time of year, they, would, they lit fires and jumped through them and um, put, I think it was red dots on us. Anyhow, it was a wild time. Okay, I'm, not, I'm just not going to hear you today. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for, uh, for suggesting it. Within the congregation, we're lighting a candle for member Kate Simpson, who had a fall this past Monday. Her fall resulted in a fractured vertebrae. She has a long uh, time of recovery ahead of her. Um, our pastoral care team will let us all know if there are ways that we can be of assistance, but in the meantime, we light a candle for her and hold her in our hearts. We place a final stone then for the joys and sorrows that I've shared and also such joys and sorrows among us that are express, unexpressed but of no less importance. Thank you. Now I invite you to pause for a few minutes, perhaps settle in, take a couple of deep breaths for a time of just meditation, reflection, stillness is as, mo as, as is most your custom. These words by my colleague George O'Dell. We need one another when we mourn and want comfort. We need one another when we are in trouble and are afraid. We need one another when we are in despair, in temptation, and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we strive to accomplish some great purpose and realize we cannot do it alone. We need one another in the hour of a success, when we look for someone to share triumphs. We need one another in the hour of defeat, when with encouragement, we try to endure and stand again. We need one another 
when we come to die and seek gentle hands to prepare us for the journey. All our lives, we are in need and others are in need of us. Let us pause for a few moments of stillness together. So may it be. Amen. By Marge Piercy. Connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot tell always by looking what is happening. More than half of the tree is spread out under the soil, uh, in the soil under your feet. Penetrate quietly as the earthworm, earthworm that blows no trumpet. Fight persistently as the creeper that brings down the tree spread like the squash plant that overruns the garden, gnaw in the dark, and use the sun to make sugar. Weave real connections, create real nodes, build real houses, live a life you can endure, make love that is loving, keep tangling and interweaving and taking more in, a thicket and bramble wilderness to the outside, but to us, interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and layers. Live as if you liked yourself, and it may happen. Reach out. Keep reaching out. Keep bringing in. This is how we are going to live for a long time. Not always, for every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. You're up, sir. The second reading is from Solidarity by Richard Rorty. The right way to take the slogan, we have obligations to human beings as such, is as a means of reminding ourselves 
to keep trying to expand our sense of us as far as we can. That slogan urges us to extrapolate further in the direction set by certain events in the past. The inclusion among us of the family in the next cave, then of the tribe across the river, then of the tribal confederation beyond the mountains, then of the unbelievers beyond the seas, and perhaps, last of all, of the menials who all this time have been doing our dirty work. This is a process which we should keep going. We should stay on the lookout for marginalized people, people whom we still instinctively think of as they rather than us. We should try to notice our similarities with them. The right way to construe the slogan is as urging us to create a more expansive sense of solidarity than we presently have. The wrong way is to think of it as urging us to recognize such a solidarity as something that exists antecedently to our recognition of it. <clears throat> For then we leave ourselves open to the pointlessly skeptical question, is this solidarity real? We leave ourselves open to Nietzsche's insulation, insinuation that the end of religion and metaphysics should mean the end of our attempts not to be cruel. Back in, <clears throat> back in January of 1983, in the cold, the deep cold of January, when you're in Minneapolis, One day, one Sunday, more than 100 people stayed after the service in the spacious sanctuary of the First Universalist Church there in Minneapolis. Along with a team of ministers affiliated with the congregation um, and members, I helped to lead the faithful who had gathered through a series of questions that invited their thoughts, hunches, ideas about what belonged in Article 2 of the bylaws of the Unitarian Universalist Association, that section of our bylaws that has to do with principles. A youthful intern at the time, I was excited to take part in that conversation and spent time with flip chart sheets and markers writing down all the things that the folks in my small group talked about and the ideas that they thought were most important to be included. Now a quick recap of Article 2. Um, and the principles for those of you who aren't familiar with them, just in case there are a few of you who have missed the, these memos over these past uh, some months. When the Unitarian, uh, American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America consolidated in 1961, like all organizations that are incorporated in the state of Massachusetts, they were required to include a statement of principles and purposes for this new organization. The list crafted at the time by two committees of ministers, all white, all male, I'll just note, lacked some awareness that was noted by organizations of women in the early 1980s, and a conversation was begun to revise them. A commission was formed and a denomination-wide conversation was held, eventually creating a new set of principles and purposes that were approved in 1985. We are in the process of another revision right now. But when I think back to those conversations nearly 40 years ago, what I remember most clearly is the importance in those days of our growing recognition 
of our deep relationship to the entire ecosystem of our planet. My memory is that most of the sheets that we took away from that gathering and compiled, most of them wanted there to be something about how we needed to be mindful of our relationship to the planet. This was nearly 14 years after Earth Day had been first observed, and our awareness of what we were doing to the planet was slowly growing. It likely helped to get that on our flip chart notes. Um, it likely helped that the booklet that was sent to congregations at that time suggested that we all reflect upon what we can commonly affirm. They listed a few possibilities, and I can tell you this because I still have a copy of the Ding Dang um, booklet all these many years later. So these were the concerns that they suggested we might want to pay attention to. Feminist concerns, ethical social concern principles, theological statements, the democratic process, congregational polity, shared history, ecological concerns. The Reverend Walter Royal Jones, who chaired the committee that crafted the current principles, noted six of the principles that were in that original 1961 um, source um, were suggested um, by the process in... <laughs> so, Walter. Um, who chaired the committee, suggested that the, our current principles, the ones that we have in our bylaws now, um, noted six of the principles that were suggested in the um, one that was done back in the 60s, but they were worded differently for 1984. The concepts were still there. The difference was the seventh principle, and how many of you know what our seventh principle is? If you want to, say it with me respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. He said this was overwhelmingly mandated in the responses received from churches and fellowships at the time. Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. You know, that's the kind of thing that we can only grasp in moments and living in an awareness of and respect for it is a Sisyphean task. Interdependence is about relationship, relationship, relationship. There's nothing that exists somehow alone and away from everything else. Matthew Fox quotes John Muir in his book, Original Blessings, as he explains it. Quoting from Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The whole wilderness is unity and interrelation. It is alive and familiar. Then Matthew Fox comments, all things are interrelated because all things are microcosms of macrocosms, and it is all in motion, it is all in root, it is moving, vibrant, dancing, and full of surprises. It is all a blessing, an ongoing and fertile blessing with a holy salvic history of about 20 billion years. Hmm. It's hard to imagine that whole swirling, interconnected, interrelated infinity of which we are but a very small part. Doug Adams, in his trilogy, um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, y'all remember that one? In that, he describes what might give you some sense of that, the total perspective vortex. It could perhaps help us to see it. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the device, let me um, <clears throat> allow me to quote from uh, Wikipedia, which is our own version of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Let me just note. This is what they, Wikipedia says about it. It was designed by Trin Tragula in order to annoy his wife because she was forever nagging him for having no sense of proportion. He decided to invent something that would show her what having a sense of proportion would really be. Unfortunately, the shock, being placed in the, vor of the shock of being placed in the vortex 
destroyed her brain, but Trin Tragula's grief was tempered by the knowledge that he had been right and she had been wrong. <laughs> In Adam's words, the total perspective vortex illustrated that, quote, in an infinite universe, the one thing sentient life cannot afford is to have a sense of proportion. The total perspective vortex. You see, it really does give you a sense of where you are in the universe. Doug Adams tells us, when you're put into the vortex, you are given just one momentary glimpse of the entire unimaginable infinity of creation, and somewhere in it is a tiny mark, a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot which says, you are here. Getting a handle on the vastness of the whole of the cosmos of which we are a small and possibly very annoying part, that awareness would re likely require some consciousness raising, oh, sorry, would require some consciousness altering chemicals. <clears throat> but in moments, I think we can perceive it. And it's what is at the core of relationship, relationship, relationship. Because it's true that we're, not, we're never not in relationship with everything, everywhere, all at once. Both Marge Piercy and Richard Rorty offer us perspectives about all that interdependedness. Piercy reminds us of all the wild buzz of interconnections that exist, the roots that spread under our feet, the tangling and interweaving of relationships that sustain and nourish us. You cannot tell always by looking what is happening, she reminds us. Most of what keeps us all in relationship to each other and the planet, the cosmos, all of it, all of it is outside of our awareness. I fear that if it wasn't, we'd be totally paralyzed, unable to function in any meaningful way. It reminds me of a story told by Lauren Isley, who... Um, talked about a, a, a physicist who, in his old age, took to wearing giant boots um, to get around his house. He did this because he was in fear that he would fall through the vast spaces that there were between atoms and disappear. I love this image of, of a man bounding in giant boots across his living room just to get a cool drink of water from the kitchen. I think if we lived in an awareness of how all of this worked, the connections, and our impact all the time, we could be likewise panicked, terrified, and unable to move. Richard Rorty, in the excerpt we heard today from his essay, Solidarity, reminds us that as humans, we need to pay attention and build relationship and con connection between us. Carter Hayward, one of my favorite authors, says this too. She says it this way, we are not automatic lovers of self, others, world, or God. Love does not just happen. We are not love machines, puppets on the strings of a deity called love. Love is a choice, not simply or necessarily a rational one but rather a willingness to be present to others without pretense or guile. Interdependence is the reality of our lives. It always has been and it always will be. But we get to make a choice about how we live into an ever-deepening awareness of that interdependence. It needs to be manifest in the way that we live the efforts that we take to minimize our impact on the planet in the small and larger ways that we can. I continue to appreciate the commitment of this congregation that has made a commitment to being a green sanctuary, striving to be conscious always, aware, striving to reduce our impact on the earth, even in the small ways that we can, 
cloth napkins and towels, as few single-use items as we can manage among the many other, among other commitments. I trust that all of us make those kinds of choices, finding out ways to live into our dependence upon the natural world. As a part of that work, as a part of that, we also need to keep working, as Hayward suggests, to be present to others without pretense or guile. We need to be building that sense of solidarity with each other, paying attention to those that we distance ourselves from. Marge Piercy directs us to keep tangling, interweaving, and taking more in a thicket and brambles uh, of wilderness interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and lairs. Friends, our interconnectedness is a fact. It is a both and that we live with and in. Seeing that there is nothing anywhere ever that is wholly disconnected from everything else that is and building day by day our ability to remember that that's true. It's true about the people who surround us, about the paths we travel each day, and also those people in distant places, in Gaza, in Ukraine, in Russia, the child who is lost, the elder who is lonely. Our interdependence is inescapable. And so today I say, let us choose. Let us choose every day to keep building that awareness and to live, di live deeply into all of our interconnectedness. So may it be. Amen. Let's sing. Our closing hymn is number um, 1018, Come and Go With Me. If you don't want to read the words up there, you can grab a teal hymnal and sing along. Please be seated. 
our closing words by George Brooks. May the love that gets, gives beauty to life, the reverence that gives life, to life its sacredness, and the purpose that gives to life its deep significance, be strong within each of us and lead us into ever-deepening relationship with, the, with all of life. So may it be. Please join me in our extinguishing, chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish our flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Red-winged blackbird down my road.